Greetings, Wonder Dippers. Michael Phillip here. Lovely to have you in the mind meld, as it always is. This one in particular, though, because what if I told you, my friends, that reality is far weirder than anything you've yet conceived of. This includes reality being a simulation or some kind of matrix-like ontology. And not only is it a far weirder idea, it is far more plausible, at least in my mind, but much more importantly, in the mind of our brilliant partner in this mind meld, Dr. Donald Hoffman. If you've heard of Don, you have some notion of where this is going. But Don really is a unique kind of genius, not just in the intellectual credentials sense, though he does have that. He has a PhD from MIT in computational psychology. He's a professor of cognitive sciences at the University of California, Irvine. He has published heaps of papers on perception and consciousness. So he is a big brained being to be sure. He's also the author of the book, The Case Against Reality, How Evolution Hid the Truth from Our Eyes, and his TED Talk on the topic of reality being illusory has millions and millions of views. On top of all of that, uh, and this may be one of the greatest signs of his genius, is he is incredibly humble. Uh, he's quick to diminish his ideas and accomplishments despite their clear brilliance. I do have to put some kind of brain melter alert at the outset of this one, my friends, because what Dr. Donald Hoffman is proposing is not only radical and technical, but it really will challenge your ideas about the nature of reality. Like I said, all the way past reality being some kind of illusion or matrix to something far stranger and as I also said, based on the evidence, far more likely. So what does Don think reality is? Well, I will resist the urge to riff on it too much because I'm sure the deeper I go into my explanation, I will just end up insulting it with mouth noises. But essentially what Don is arguing is that consciousness is the fundamental ground floor of reality. Uh, that reality is comprised of what he calls a network of conscious agents. We'll, we'll get into the technicals of what that means a little bit in this podcast. But the most important thing to note is that Donald Hoffman believes that physical reality, as we perceive it, yourself, all the stuff around you, is not real. That the way we perceive it is simply due to evolutionary necessity. In other words, we need to perceive reality in this way to survive and function, but what we are perceiving is not real. It, not even a little bit real. It doesn't represent any percentage of reality. Only evolutionary necessity, survival necessity. Again, much more complex than that, but I wanted to give you at least some kind of a primer. I would also highly recommend his TED talk on this topic as well. It's only about 10 minutes, I believe, so it's pretty digestible, though definitely no less brain melting. If you want to keep up with the great Dr. Donald Hoffman, follow him on Twitter at Donald D. Hoffman. Definitely pick up his Neuron Exploding book, The Case Against Reality. And like I said numerous times now, definitely check out his TED talk. Quick self-promotional bardo before we hop into the mind meld. I would, of course, deeply appreciate it if you took a moment to like and subscribe to the channel. We've also got a back catalog of over 300 audio-only Wonder Dips. You can find those on Apple and Spotify or wherever you procure your podcast. Subscribing and reviewing on those platforms is also greatly appreciated as it does help increase the circumference of our psychic splash across multiple digital dimensions. We've also got a Patreon where you can support us, and we're also wonder dipping there on the daily 
on our patron only discord and our patron only zoom hangs i also send out physical rewards like stickers pins shirts and more to patrons depending on pledge level for all of the above and more patreon.com forward slash third eye drops and with that let us pierce the portal of this mind meld with the wise wonderful whimsical dr donald hoffman dr donald hoffman it is always such a true true pleasure to meld minds with you uh and discuss this thing we call reality because believe me i have done my fair amount of mental masturbation and prognostication about what reality is but you are one of my favorite people, if not my favorite person on this planet to discuss this topic with, both from, you know, just because of your intellectual prowess, but also because of this philosophy you've developed and that it's a philosophy based on such scientific and mathematical rigor and precision. And there are few, if any, people out there um, doing it as well as you, I think. So... Love having you on. So glad you're doing well again. And and thanks for being here. Thank you so much, Michael. It's a great pleasure. And it's very kind of you to invite me back. So I'm, I'm yes. looking forward to our conversation. Yeah. So like I said, it's, I, I have some, some really nerdy questions I would love to get into with you right from the jump, but I think it would be a slight disservice to everybody listening if we didn't go over the sort of basic thesis of your way of looking at the world, where it comes from, how you arrived at that, and also how your outlook differs. Because there there's this there's this camp of people that's emerged. Like the 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 sum the sum spin on reality is a simulation or reality is is uh like a matrix like construct or something like that. But the reason I love your philosophy again is because your angle is different for one and for two i would say it's even weirder i would say it's even harder <laughs> for people to wrap their minds around yet it seems way more likely to me um for for reasons we'll get into so so with that i'll stop rambling and and please take the con well, yes yeah, so i'm trying to understand how consciousness fits into everything and Many of my colleagues are doing the same. It, you know, the study of consciousness and its relationship to brain activity and to physical processes more generally has something has been something that we've really been studying now since the late '80s and early '90s, really much quite seriously. Of course, there was work before that, but it, it was few and far between. Now, now it's a serious topic. But most of my brilliant colleagues who are studying this make the assumption that space time and its particles its objects are fundamental. And so they're trying to start with uh, a scientific theory in which the basic premises are, there are there is space-time, it's fundamental. The, the laws of, of, of physics within space-time, the particles and then their combinations into to larger objects. And somehow consciousness has to emerge from complex interactions of these particles, for example, in neural systems or artificial intelligence systems that are properly programmed, that that's one track. And, and so there are all sorts of ideas, you know, maybe it's you know, orchestrated collapse of quantum states and microtubules in, in, in the brain, in neuronal, neuronal micro, microtubules. Yeah, that's maybe like, is that the global works? Is that like a Hameroff? Is that his? Yeah, Hameroff yeah, and Penrose. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah. Th that's their theory. The global workspace, uh, Bernard Bar uh, Bars and others who worked on that, where the idea is that the, it's somehow um, an, a, a, a working memory kind of system in the brain, or perhaps in a, in a computational system more generally. And the global access that the of the objects that are in working memory somehow gives rise to the experience of consciousness, uh, at least in some versions of it. So there are a number of theories like that, the uh, attention schema theory of my, uh, Gra Michael Graziano and, and, and others. Then there are panpsychist theories like, like Philip Goff's theories where um, they're trying to bring consciousness in as a more fundamental thing, but they typically, at least um, 
in Goff's approach, for example, and in a lot of the, the current panpsychist approaches, space-time and its particles are still fundamental. Mm -hmm. But the idea is that in addition to their basic physical properties like position, momentum, spin, and charge, and so forth, um, they also have perhaps a fundamental unit of consciousness. So that's a, it's another um, property of particles is, is consciousness. And then you have to have a theory of, of how these consciousnesses combine. So if I have consciousness associated with an electron and a, and a proton, then how do they combine to, to make a hydrogen a consciousness and so forth? Yeah. So, so that, those are the kind, but my attitude is, okay. I mean, these, these are brilliant people. Many of them are, are good friends, um, but they're making an assumption that I think contradicts our best science. So two of our best scientific theories, evolution by natural selection on the one hand, and on the other hand, the combination of quantum field theory and Einstein's theory of gravity, on the other hand. And both of these groups of theories say the same thing. They, they tell us, I think unequivocally, that space-time cannot be fundamental. Now, they, the theories are very, very clear about that. Space-time is not fundamental. That means that particles are not fundamental. And that means that the entire um, space-time reductionist approach to the scientific problem, which we try to go to smaller and smaller scales in space-time to find the more and more fundamental elements of reality and rules or laws of reality, and use that to, to then boot up a theory of everything and a, th in, in a particular theory of consciousness, mm -hmm. which is yeah. what we're interested in. Yeah. So that whole approach, which has been so successful, by the way, for the last century and, and longer. So it's, you know, space time is fundamental and then reductionism within space time uh, as a strategy, as a methodology has been incredibly successful. But our best theories are now telling us that that strategy um, is not going to work ultimately because space time itself is not fundamental. And therefore, this space-time reductionist approach as a methodology can't work. And, and the theories, so ev the theory of evolution by natural selection, and then the, on the other hand, quantum field theory and gravity, they, they can only tell us that space-time isn't fundamental. They cannot tell us what is beyond, right? So if space-time is not it, what, what is the next step beyond space-time? There, we have to be um, adventurous, we have to, as, as scientists, uh, think out of the box, uh, get our ideas wherever we can, uh, from friends, from a beer, from whatever you, you, wherever you get your ideas. But then, you know, once you've got a freewheeling uh, and interesting idea, then you have to make it mathematical and make it testable and project it back into space time. Whatever you come up with beyond space time, you have to project it back into space time where we can measure. So it turns out that the physicists have been making great strides on this, right? So in the last 15 years, 15, 20 years, uh, it's been very, very clear. Ed Witten has said, you know, space-time is doomed. Uh, Nathan Seiberg says he doesn't think space-time is fundamental. And Nima Arkani Hamed has, has been quite outspoken. He's at the Institute for Advanced Study at Princeton, quite outspoken saying space-time is doomed and, and this physicalist uh, reductionist approach cannot be the right methodology, that, that that whole reductionist methodology is doomed. You can't yeah. go to smaller scales in space and time to get to more fundamental laws because, as he discusses, as you go smaller and smaller at some point, you're going to create a black hole. Mm -hmm. And, you know, higher energies are needed to go to smaller scales of space. And at some point, the energy gets so high that, that, that gravity comes in and spoils the party. You know, it creates a black hole and you destroy the very thing you're trying to measure. So, mm -hmm. so as, as Nima or Connie Hamed points out, the very notion of spatial dimensions smaller than 10 to the minus 33 centimeters or temporal uh, dimensions less than 10 to the minus 43 seconds have no operational meaning. There, there is no operational meaning that we can give to them. So, so space time, so it's not like all of a sudden we get pixels of space time. It's just yeah. that space time itself becomes undefined. So this is yeah. not that space time is pixelated. So this is different from some theories that say there are pixels of space time is saying, no, 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 we need a completely new methodology. And I'll just say, and then I'll stop for a minute, is that uh, the physicists are finding things beyond space time. So this mm -hmm. is not just a hand wave. They've got structures that are actually doing the job. It's pretty fun. Yeah, yeah. I was just going to say that this is something that some physicists were trying to do, this notion that we're going to find a fundamental 
pixel of space time, some irreducible bit of physical reality or uh, of basic physics, at least, that we can work with and understand. And then from there, we can expand that out and explain how we get reality. So I, I had heard that this is a thing, you know, that they're they're trying to do with various actual experiments. And, and you're saying this is something that in your mind and, and in the mind of people like uh, Ahmed, if I'm saying his name right, um, this is just not a successful endeavor at this point. Right. So, so Nima Arkani Hamed has made the point in some of his lectures that uh, you really can't make sense of pixels of space time. That that you, you have trouble with with relativistic problems. Like, mm. So it's small in whose reference frame? If if we have this, mm. if you have this tiny pixel that's that's you know ten to the minus mm. thirty three centimeters, well, in whose reference frame are you talking about? And how do you get? So you have Einstein's special theory of relativity that you have have to deal with. So so. But the other thing that, that the yeah, physicists okay. are pointing to is that, look, when you let go of space-time, you find these new structures. And, and it turns out that permutations of all things, something as simple as a permutation, like you know, just flipping things around, permutations turn out to be really central to this. And, and when you study these permutations, you get these structures that they call um, you know, positive Grossmannians, which are you know effectively code for convex combinations of permutations. And then you get this thing called the amplitudehedron, which gives you, it, it's this structure in high dimensions, but it's just sitting there. It's like a like a platonic, it's not a platonic solid, but it's like a platonic mm. solid, it's just sitting up there, right? Interesting, okay. And it's, its volumes code the probabilities of scattering events, or the, what they call the amplitudes of scattering events, at, like the Large Hadron Collider, like two gluons smashing in and four gluons flying out. The, the volumes of this thing code for that and the the facet structure is like a, a big polygon in high dimensions, and so you have all these faces and then edges and then you know even vertices and so forth. It turns out that the structure of the faces, edges, and vertices codes for features in, in space time, like mm. the, the the unitarity in quantum theory and locality. So so it turns out that you get the structure outside of space and time. It it does two beautiful things that that's truly stunning. One is when you when you use mathematics in space time to compute these scattering amplitudes. So, like for two gluons hitting each other and four gluons spraying out, which happens millions or billions of times in a, in a collider, and you, you they know about those things, so they want to be able to compute them and, and get rid of them. Well, it turns out that if you do it in space time, you use the math and uh, quantum field theory and and something called Feynman diagrams, you get billions of terms. Billions of terms because you have to look at all the loops, all these virtual particles that that mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. that you have to use to make for unitarity in space time. So you, you get the, the math is just terrible. It's hundreds of pages of math, billions of terms, and you can't do it even on a supercomputer. And so the the the, the experimentalist asked the theorist, please, you know, can you help us here? <laughs> can you make this math simpler? It turns out when you let go of space time. The math turns into one term. You can write it down by hand and compute it trivially. Mm -hmm. So space time is getting in the way. The math is ugly. And then the last thing is there's these symmetries, symmetries of the scattering data that you can't see in space time, so-called wow. dual conformal symmetry. But it's really transparently there when you let go of space time and you see these new deep structures. So you're seeing new symmetries and the math becomes simple. So, you know, that's just wonderful. You let go of space time and you make real progress. So that so that elegance to you is evidence of there being something there that we're we're unnecessarily complicating it with these pre-existing assumptions like space time because we just want to fit everything into relativity. So we because that's the dominant way of explaining the universe. So we we have to funnel everything through that. And so that that makes sense, and that's very very interesting. Right, can I give quick, an analogy? Like, about yeah. What, can, can I give you a quick parallel? Sure. I just wanted to. Oh, sure. I just wanted sure. to uh, turn you on to. Um, when you compared this higher dimensional structure, the am amplihedron is that what you said? Amplitudehedron. Amplitudehedron, and and you said platonic solid. That made a light bulb go off because Plotinus, the famous um, Neoplatonic philosopher. This kind of fits into his ontology, Don, because 
he talks about the way that a human soul incarnates is through a process called soul fall. So it's not that your soul is something that's yours and it's in your body and then it goes somewhere else. It's that your soul has actually projected itself down from a higher reality and that it gets sort of hypnotized into some small aspect of itself. And that small aspect of itself becomes you in this dimension. So that there, there actually are these higher realities of consciousness, according to him. And, and again, you know, the platonic ontology has a lot of math or at least, you know, uh, geometry involved in, in how they make sense of these things. So yeah, that, that's, uh, that's creating some, some interesting, I don't know, at least synchronicities or parallels or something that, that have, uh, perked up my wonder whiskers a bit. But but yeah, please continue with wherever you're going. Right. No, I'd agree with what you were saying. I, I think that that's a really interesting direction to pursue. And in fact, I am pursuing something along mm. that line. I, I would, of course, point out that the, the physicists that I mentioned um, should not be taken to endorse anything that I'm saying here about consciousness. Okay. Right. I mean, they're, 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 they found these, these solid structures beyond the, like the amplitudehedron and something called the cosmological polytope and associahedron and so forth. Um, I, so far as I know, the notion of consciousness having anything to do with this is not even on their radar. So, so I, I, I don't want to to claim anything about their view on this. But, but I think that the structures that they're finding are there. There are these static platonic platonic solids, not in the sense that you know there are the, the, the basic platonic solids. They're pl platonic not because they're a member of that set, but because they're just these solids out in you know Plato's ideal world. Yeah, yeah. There's yeah. no notion of, um, but with the, with these solids that they're finding, like the amplitudehedron, there's no notion of process. It's just this mm -hmm. static structure. And so, really? so you, okay. you, ask, you have to ask, you know, okay, so permutations are fundamental. And these structures code these permutations. And, and then the volumes give you the scattering amplitudes. But, but who ordered that? Why? Well, yeah. what, what are the permutations permutations of? And, and why? What is, what is the nature of this reality beyond space-time that also... So my attitude at, about it is they they're they're using the flashlight of mathematics to peer into the dark beyond space time. You know, they're very they're brave and brilliant people, absolutely brave and brilliant. And they found these structures and they and and they work and and they're and they're actually making the math easy and they're getting the answers right. And but the question is what is it about? And and there's no answer yet about mm -hmm. what are these structures about? And so one thing I'm up to is trying to show that with, with a theory of, of conscious agents that, that I'm working on, when you look at the long-term behavior of these agents, so you, so you have this, this network of conscious agents and you could look at, you know, what is, what is Joe saying to Pete and so forth, or you could look at the, the big trends, like social trends, like on, on, on social media. What are the trends? That's the yeah. long-term behavior. Yeah. And it turns out that, so, that the trends in the behavior of these conscious agent networks some of the trends can be captured by the same kinds of structures that the physicists are finding. So, so it, it turns out that the so-called asymptotic behavior um, can be captured by some of the structures that the physicists are, are, are coming up with, but, but not all of this. So the, it, it suggests what I'm going to try to show is that we have this theory of conscious agents. So consciousness is fundamental. One way of describing the long-term behavior is what the physicists are finding. It's not the only way to describe the long-term behavior, but it's one interesting way. And when you describe it that way, then you get a map all the way into space-time. So, mm -hmm. so I'm hoping to show that, start off with the theory of consciousness, look at one way of looking at the trends among conscious agents, that plugs into the amplitudehedron, and then the physicists take you all the way into space-time. So I'm that would you, then yeah. be a, a, a bridge where you start with consciousness, and then take advantage of all the beautiful work that the physicists are doing, who perhaps have no interest in consciousness, by the way. I, I don't know. Maybe some right, of them right. do. Some of them, but, it, but there's no explicit um, in their work, nothing explicit about consciousness at all. So, so, so that's how I'm hoping to go through all the way. Oh, yeah. No. And I'm with you. I'm totally with you. But I've also had four or however many uh, multi-hour conversations with you. And I've read your book. And I've watched your, a lot of your talks. So, so I just want to back it up to people for, for people. So when Don says 
consciousness is fundamental. Take that notion as far as you can, dear listener, including to a point where he's saying nothing physical is fundamental. And not only is it not fundamental, it's not even real. It's not even like your table, your chair, your, you know, everything you give context to yourself with in the physical world is not real, or at least it is not anything approaching the way that you perceive it to be. And um, I could continue with this, but I feel like I want to let you explain explain the uh, the icon interface notion before before I start getting into it. And and then I think people will understand why the, the temptation is to start thinking in terms of simulation and why, as I said at the beginning, it's even weirder because simulation is something, oh, I know what that is. I play a video game. It's kind of like that. I do something on the computer. It's kind of like that. But that's assuming that there are some real physical properties in the universe and there's some programmer and there's some concept we can wrap our minds around and and your theory goes even deeper than that past way past all of that and i i I would love to just let you riff on that for a moment right so i think one way to understand this is from the point of view of evolution by natural selection so we can ask the question do sensory systems evolve to show us the truth about reality, or at least the truths that we need to survive about reality? And most of my colleagues would say yes. They would say, of course, if those of our ancestors who saw reality more accurately would have a competitive advantage in the basic you know, activities of life, feeding, fighting, fleeing, and mating, that, that are, are critical. And, and so they would be more likely to survive and pass on their genes, which coded for the more accurate perceptions. So we're the offspring of those who in each generation had more accurate perceptions. So we see not all of the truth, but we see the truth that we need. And so, so I see tables and chairs. I don't see their atoms, but I didn't need to see their atoms. But I do see, what I do see is, is the truth and space and time are the truth. And it turns out you can ask a technical question. What is the probability that evolution by natural selection would shape sensory systems to show you some truths about reality? And it, it turns out, and we've got publications on this that people can look at, that the probability is zero. The, the probability is zero that any sensory system has ever been shaped by natural selection to show any truths about objective reality. So what, what instead seems to be the case, now this gets to your point, your, your question, what evolution seems to have given us is more like a virtual reality headset, right? So if you're playing a virtual reality game like Grand Theft Auto, you know, in that metaphor, what you're really interacting with is some supercomputer with diodes and resistors and voltages and magnetic fields and Mm -hmm. hundreds of megabytes of software. Well, if you had to toggle voltages to play the game or jiggle the software in real time to, you know, to play the game, um, you would lose compared to someone who just had on their headset and a, and a virtual uh, steering wheel and so forth, virtual gas pedal, and was just trying to play the game. And, and so that's sort of the idea of the evolution of natural selection theorem. Evolution shapes us with headsets that hide the truth and just give us the bells and whistles we need to play the game of life. You don't need to know the truth. In fact, knowing the truth, like in the computer, <clears throat> having to know about the voltages <coughs> won't be a help. It'll, it'll get in the way. So we, we have this <clears throat> interface that lets us, excuse me, <coughs> that lets us play the game of life, <clears throat> even though um, we, we know nothing about the reality uh, that's behind it. And so, so that's the idea. So, and, and then what you were saying about objects um, not existing or not being real in the sense that we think of them as real, think of it this way. If you're playing, you know, Grand Theft Auto, with some friends, and you turn your headset to the right and you see a, a red Mustang. Well, you create that Mustang when you look. There is no red Mustang inside the supercomputer. There is not in the software. There's no red must. There's nothing red. There's nothing with with rubber tires anywhere inside that computer, in the software or anywhere. So all that's happening is that photons are being sprayed to your eye from your headset, and you're creating that Mustang on the fly. As soon as you turn your head over there, now I'm looking and seeing a, a you know a white. Porsche. 
Well, I've deleted the red Mustang and I've created the white Porsche. And as soon as I look away from the white Porsche, it no longer exists at all. It, it only exists in my memory because I created it, but there's nothing tangible out there. And, and you might say, well, but other people see the same things. I mean, if I look and see the moon, everybody else says I see the moon. But think about it in virtual reality. I've got a bunch of friends around the world playing Grand Theft Auto with me. If I ask them, is, is, the, is the red Mustang about to run through that red light? And they can all say, yeah, I see the red Mustang. It's, it's running through the red light. Well, that's because they're all making their own red Mustangs. And as soon as they look away, they, they delete their own red Mustangs. So there's no such thing as the red Mustang. And so there's no such thing as the moon. When you and I both look up and I say, do you see the moon? And you say, yes. Uh, well, that, that's because I see the moon that I create and you see a moon that you create. And we use language and we, we think that we agree. So, so that's what I mean when I say that space time and objects are not fundamental. You create them on the fly as needed and then you delete them um, when you don't need them anymore. So they're not there. And you, and you might say, well, <clears throat> that's one thing for a cognitive scientist to say that kind of thing. But surely the physicist will tell you that those particles in the moon really are there when no one looks. Uh, and it turns out that the physicists have looked at this question very, very carefully. They have technical terms. They call it local realism and non-contextual realism. So it's a, they, they cash out this question, is the electron really there when no one looks? Is the moon really there when no one looks? That's local realism and non-contextual realism. And the answer to both is no, it's not there. In, in both technical senses, we have clean evidence from our best theories and experiments um, testing quantum theory that local realism is false. So evolution of natural selection and quantum field theory with gravity are telling us the same thing. Space-time is not fundamental. Objects are just data structures that we create and delete as needed. Uh, they're not the truth. And we're finding a first step with the amplitudehedron and cosmological polytope of deep structures that are completely beyond space-time. And by the way, completely beyond quantum theory. Mm -hmm. so, so it's not like quantum theory is the fundamental thing and space-time emerges from No, no. It's that quantum theory and space-time together emerge from something that's more fundamental where there aren't even things called Hilbert spaces. You have to have Hilbert spaces to have quantum theory. There, there are no Hilbert spaces. So, so that's, that's the key, uh, a key point here. So there's these deeper structures that I'm hoping to show that these deeper structures that the physicists find really are coding for some of the long-term trending behavior of, of dynamics of consciousness that's even deeper. Wow. Yeah, I'm, I'm so fascinated by these deeper structures. And I think you were just starting to look into this when we talked last time. But yeah. one of the, the key sort of notions that I think people should try to wrap their minds around in this conversation is is just non-locality. This idea that consciousness itself, if your theory is true, has nothing to do with any physical, local processes. Of course, there, there are things happening in the brain. There are hormones, there are neurotransmitters. There are all of these things where if you altered the brain, your perception of reality would be completely different if you even still had a perception of reality at all. Like clearly you can blow away this concept that we call the brain. And my, at least my experience as Michael would probably cease to exist, but what you're saying and, and what many others have, have stated is that still the fundamental property of consciousness, whatever it is. And I think that's so difficult for people to really wrap their minds around because they only have what their personal conscious experience is. And that's all predicated on this icon simulation reality, quote unquote, if you will. But, but what you're saying is that consciousness itself is a phenomenon that does not locally exist within you. It's and and you're also not saying from what, what I've heard you say in other interviews that you're also not saying that you're streaming consciousness as a receiver either, but that it's something completely non-local. It's something that has nothing to do with your with your physical place in any 
conceptual framework that we are are aware of. So I know many people have proposed similar things. So part one of the question is, have there been any actual experiments done that you would point to that that really prove this? Um, that that consciousness is not local, is not in the body, but is some process that we don't we don't have a way to even measure or or fully understand. Um, and two, how how did you arrive on this point of of non locality and become convinced of it? Right. So so the physicists are basically telling us that that locality in space and time. Is is merely a data structure that that the, the the this fundamental reality that they're finding that's behind space time it, it it can code for locality but it's not even a, a space time structure it's something deeper than than space time so all the stuff that we're seeing is coming from this deeper realm outside of space and time of course they're they're not talking about consciousness so that's that's where I, I do something different but. But the standard view of most of my colleagues is that you know, the brain exists and has the definite dynamics, even when it's not perceived, and that brain activity or embodied brain activity, the interaction of the, the brain in the body interacting with the physical environment, that that loop um, is, is creating consciousness. So it's starting with the assumption that, that, that space-time is fundamental, the brains really exist. And, and what I'm saying is, Physics tells us that space-time is not fundamental, and so does evolution by natural selection. This means, and I'll be very blunt, I don't have a brain right now. If you looked inside, you would see neurons and you would see a brain. But that's the same way as when you look in the VR game with Grand Theft Auto, you create the red Camaro or the red Mustang when you look. And as soon as you look away, it, it's gone. I have no brain right now. I have no neurons. Of course, if you looked inside my brain, you would see inside my skull, you would see brains and neurons. You would find them. But that doesn't mean that they were that they're there now. There, there's so that's the interface idea. I mean, the interface symbols are there as long as you perceive them. And as soon as you in, in virtual reality, as soon as you look away, those symbols are gone. So it's really hard for us to wrap our heads around it because we we think of ourselves as something that's inside a body inside my brain but that's the mistake if you're in a vr simu if you're in a vr world you're playing grand theft auto you have an avatar now if you get really into the game you could lose yourself and identify with your avatar all of a sudden you you could actually be afraid of things hurting that avatar and bumping into that you you, you it, with good vr that can actually happen you can get so into it yeah. that uh, you have visceral uh you know responses to damage to your avatar well your body and your brain these are just avatars you're you're not in the avatar the avatar is in you the avatar is is one of the just like you create the red mustang in the v you also create your avatar so so this is a complete reversal of the way we think about things we think there is this body it's a physical body, and, and certain parts of this body, like my brain, are creating my consciousness. So if something happens to my brain, then my consciousness will be destroyed. And if, if my body dies, then my consciousness is completely gone. We have to turn that completely around. Think of your brain and your body as like a VR avatar. Well, those are symbols that you create. Your consciousness is creating those symbols. So it's completely the other way around. You're not in the avatar. The avatar is in you. And so this this is a complete mind warp that takes a long time. I, I, I've been thinking about this for years, and it's such a hard mind warp that that just in my own personal life, I still have to spend a lot of time wrapping my head around it. But this is where our science is telling us to go. And and perhaps it's no surprise you know, from an evolutionary point of view, we, we didn't need to know the truth. <laughs> and, and so uh, we have a conceptual system that uh, is, is going to be completely confounded by this from an evolutionary point of view. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it, but, it almost we, seems like... I was just going to say, it almost seems like not only do we not need to know the truth, it seems like it seems almost like we're not supposed to know the truth. It seems almost like we're we're specifically designed to have limitations. And if we're not, if there's not some sort of like teleological imperative at the outset where, where we're designed to like you don't, you know, like in Grand Theft Auto, for example, 
a character that just exists in the game cannot go outside the game. It's just not possible. And it almost feels like we're we're stuck in that. Yet at the same time, we also have tools that reach beyond the scope of our perception and beyond the scope of our physical ability to manipulate the world. So perhaps then we do have an avenue to do this exploration. And, and I guess that's your your contention, right? That, that's right. So we, we can explore on a personal basis beyond space and time, right? So in, in, in meditation and, and so forth, we can hmm. um, explore that. It's, it's going to run counter to us in, in, in a lot of ways, because a lot of our assumptions do, well, I'll put it this way, Piaget, the famous uh, mm-hmm. child psychologist, um, proposed that as infants, we are wired to believe that what he calls object permanence, that objects exist and uh, have their properties even when we don't perceive them. And we get wired into it, he thought, by the time we were 18 months of age. And later research says probably even by three or four months of age, we, we have that wired into us. So we're from from that point of view, we're wired up to believe that the moon is there or, or my teddy bear, more, more to the point, my teddy bear is there even when, when it's behind a pillow, right? So mom puts the teddy bear behind the pillow. Uh, the kid knows that the teddy bear still exists. And so, so we're wired up to believe what's called object permanence. So this is not something that we came to as a rational decision on our own part. It, it, before we even had rational understanding, we were wired up to believe it. So, so as adults, it, this is something that we don't question. We, and we find it crazy to even think this way. But your point about not seeing the truth, there's a couple levels of that. First, as, just from the point of view of science, it's, I think, a pretty elementary observation that there can be no theory of everything in science. Because what is a scientific theory? It, it's, it says if you, every theory says if you grant me these assumptions, mm-hmm. then I'll explain all this other neat stuff. And that's great. I mean, that's, that's what scientific theories do. But, but notice that they don't explain their assumptions. And you can say, well, okay, I can get a deeper theory that explains those assumptions. Fabulous. And we, and we do that, and that's, that's important. But notice your new theory has its own new assumptions. You, you, there, there is no theory without assumptions. And so this process is never ending. And so there can never be a theory of everything. And, and this intuitive thing that I've just mentioned is, is made, been made formal by uh, some, some work by Kurt Gödel. So it's called yeah. Gödel's Incompleteness Theorem, right. where basically Gödel proves, and, and people can look this up, it's called Gödel's Incompleteness Theorem, that basically um, the, there's no way in a conceptual understanding of where you have a finite number of uh, assumptions, and then rules for making inferences and so forth, yeah. uh, that, that there's just no way that a system like that can, can ever lead you to all the truth. There, right. he, he proved that there will be things that are true, but not provable from within your system. And so this means that um, human thought, which is a, you can think of it, it's thought of quite a lot in cognitive science as a formal system, right? We have a, a, a finite set of, I mean, the brain is finite. So we have a finite set of, 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 symbols that we can deal with and a finite inference capacity. So, yeah. but, and that's what our, you know, it's powerful, but it's, it's finite. And Gernal says, well, uh, that means that there are effectively an infinite number of truths that you'll never reach. So yeah. in the sense that yeah. you were talking about, we actually have it on, on, on good authority from mathematics that, that um, using conceptual systems and, and scientific theory building which is very, very powerful, and, and look at how it's transformed our lives. So I'm not putting it down. I'm a scientist. I, I love it. And I love the technology that's coming out of it. I think it's a, a worthwhile enterprise. But we have to be very humble here. For all the advances that we've made, we, Gödel is telling us that you haven't even started, that the mm-hmm. that the number of truths that are yet to be explored um, is uh, are boundless. And so this is, as I, I, I like to say, it's, it's, it's infinite job security for science and for all, all truth seekers. I mean, but there is another sense. If consciousness is fundamental, cognitively, we can never know everything about it because of Gödel's theorem, right? So in terms of uh, thinking about it and getting a, a thought-based theory of consciousness, uh, we will always only scratch the surface of consciousness. 
On the other hand, you are consciousness. So you can know consciousness by being consciousness, but not through your conceptual system. And, and yet the conceptual system is not bad, is not wrong, and it, in fact, I think is essential. So I think that as we, and I don't understand this, this is a you know really deep area and I, I want to understand it more fully, but it seems like consciousness itself, even though it transcends any particular theory of it, and it, it will always and in principle transcend any theory or any perception like through space and time and physical objects of it. Nevertheless, that's how consciousness explores itself. That's how consciousness explores its possibilities is through immersing itself in virtual realities and yeah. playing, putting on the avatar, losing itself in the avatar, identifying with the avatar, and then waking up and saying, as wonderful as that VR game was, that is just a tiny fraction of my capabilities. And mm -hmm. so it's waking up by, by exploring all these possibilities and then realizing that it infinitely transcends them. So space time yeah. is billions and billions of light years across trillions of stars, hundreds of billions of galaxies. Awesome. Unbelievable. I transcend that. That's what, 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 what consciousness is doing here. So, so it's in that sense that your, your point is really well taken. We, we can't know the truth in principle, but we are the truth. And mm -hmm. so we're, 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 we have to, on the one hand, <clears throat> be good with just being with ourselves and being with the mystery of ourselves. And, and then also good with, well, what, what, what I'm up to is playing on the edges of what I am and discovering that as beautiful as that is, I transcend that. And this, this is a process that uh, in principle is never ending, according yeah. to Girdle. Yeah. And you know what? I feel like if you even suss that out into a real world scenario, like let's say you have two apples and you can say, all right, here's one apple, here's two apples. And if I add a third apple, there's going to be three apples. But if you if you say, hold on a second, where did that apple come from? You know, oh, it came from an apple tree. And then there, there's immediately this infinite regression. Like you can just keep asking, where did that come from? And where did that come from? And where did that come from? And you end up in this web of interrelated logical concepts and, and you can get to millions and billions and, and yeah, lo logically you've constructed all of these relationships and you can see how they relate to one another, but it still does not explain where those things came from or, or why they, they fit together to begin with and, and what, what kind of larger system they exist within outside the confines of what you've already perceived. So I feel like it even makes, it makes a certain amount of literal sense when you start just talking about how things relate to one another there's just never ending questions and never ending questions and i never me personally i don't understand why anyone would ever believe that they've got it figured out that they've that they've got a map that they know where it's going to lead and we're going to be able to explain all of reality this way and that's why i really love your rap about that there never will be a theory of everything you know there's that that famous quote that you've probably said on the show I've said it a bunch of times is give us one free miracle and we'll explain the rest. Right. And it's like, to, to me, that's, that's like a perfect example of, of what you're talking about. But I, I wanted to go back real quick mm -hmm. and ask you about um, any experiments that have been done and purported to show some of the non-locality qualities of consciousness. Like there are these experiments where, you know, seemingly, um, people can pierce through space and time, which is not a thing. Um, and, and, you know, have some sort of pre or some kind of precognitive, at least statistically significant precognitive ability or share thoughts. And this is something that, you know, obviously reductionist scientists are very quick to try to dismiss as bad science or not replicable or, or something like that. But have, so have, have you looked at any of these experiments and do you have an opinion on them? Right. So I'm friends with some of the people who are doing these experiments and uh, you know, I've, I've had the pleasure of doing some joint uh, seminars with Rupert Sheldrake and, and yeah. I, I know Dean Radin and, and uh, 
and so my, my attitude is, is sort of complicated on this. So I certainly agree with them that space-time is not fundamental and that consciousness is not confined to space-time. And uh, many, of, uh, many of them, and by the way, they're, they're brilliant uh, and they're, they're wonderful people. I'm, I'm good friends with some of them, but, but there is no theory. They have no theory. Hmm. And so when, when they do an experiment, so for example, there was one experiment, uh, Daryl Bem, um, where it showed pre, he thought it showed precognitive effects in this experience. So that I think it was like 400 milliseconds before some stimulus was about to be shown, they would have some kind of um, recognition, uh, uh, precognition of that of that stimulus. Okay. Okay. Now that's you know there have been attempts to replicate that, and and they've been mixed, right? So, but but here's what's really going to happen down the road. Um, none of these experiments are going to make any impression on the normal scientific community, the, the rest of the scientific community, because there's no theory, hmm. right? So it, until, so, so for example, if, if we had a theory that said, you know, it, the precognitive effect in this experiment should be 450 milliseconds, but it was only 400 milliseconds. So we need to adjust our theory. And, and, and we had, we had a theory that made that prediction. That would be that would be one thing. Well, as soon as you have a theory that makes predictions, precise predictions, now there's something for for the scientists to think about. Right now, there's there's literally nothing to think about. <laughs> right there, there is some data, um, and uh, who knows if the experiments should be taken seriously or not. Um, you know, it's not that these people aren't reputable, but but you know things happen. Right there, there's noise and all sorts of stuff. So what what the the sci community needs is not just experiments. And, I, and I'm glad they're doing experiments. The, the experiments should be done and they should be done carefully and, and so forth. Uh, so I'm all for it. But what hasn't been done and what has to be done is a theory of consciousness that predicts that where you actually predict this is the exact amount of like precognition that I expect to get or the, the whatever, whatever it might be. So until you have those theories, I, I, I can just tell you what's going to happen. You, 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 it will not be taken seriously. So here's what we have to do. You have to get it. Now, here's the other possibility. What if what we call the current laws of physics is just how consciousness interacts with this interface? That's how it works. Hmm. Right. So consciousness is not local, but the way we interact with each other, uh, we've, we've actually figured out the, the interface. So consciousness is fundamental. And maybe what the psi people want is what we're going for here, which is a theory of consciousness, maybe the conscious agent network going through the amplitude hedron into space time. But maybe one implication of that theory is going to be that um, there is no precognition of the kind that you thought in space time. It's just, it's not going to happen. We will have, to, or, or, or it will be a, a deep theory that says that, that what you thought of precognition and so forth is, is really can be thought of as a much deeper th- aspect of this uh, deeper mathematics. So, so, so my attitude is, of course, the psi experiment should continue. And, and, but, but in addition, the psi community needs to have a mathematically or, or several mathematically precise theories of consciousness and its interaction with, with space time. And you could view my theory with my colleagues, Chaitan Prakash and Manish Singh and Robert Prentner and Chris Fields and others working with me on this as perhaps, you know, trying to get a theory of psi, you know, that, that you could think of it that way. Although I'm perfectly open to having it turn out that there is no precognition that comes out of this theory. That that's just not the way consciousness works in this interface. Consciousness is not stuck in space and time. It transcends it. But when you look at it in space and time, you're not going to find precognitive. Effect. It might turn out that way. And I'm, and I'm good with that, however it turns out. Yeah, yeah. So that's what we have to do. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, ultimately, it rests on this some version of the notion that not only is consciousness fun. Well, maybe they do. I don't even know if they say consciousness is fundamental, but they say consciousness is non-local, and they try to show that through um, experiments and, and statistical uh, likelihoods of things happening. Right. 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 But if if we I kind of just lost my train of thought. What was I just, okay, let me get this back. So if, so if, so you, have you brought this up to them at all? Have you brought up like this, this notion of getting a really concrete theory of consciousness 
to back up their experiments or to somehow, uh, maybe this isn't something you're personally interested in, but to somehow combine your theory of conscious agents with their experiments? Or is this just something that is existing in two different worlds for now? Well, I, I've talked with them. So I'm, I'm personal friends with some. So I've actually said what I've said to you, to them in person, that that we need to have these mathematically precise theories before we're going to even be taken seriously at all. Now, many of, of my good friends in this community um, are are dualists. So mm. not all, but 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 many are, are dualists. They think that that space and time, and in fact, the, the, it often seems to me that psychologically, what, what's going on is is they buy that space time is fundamental, and it's it's something like a you know a physics machine, a quantum mechanical machine. But they're hoping that there's going to be some role for a ghost in the machine. So it's mm. it's so when you're looking for you know the the consciousness to you know get the Tenth decimal place of a random number generator, or something like that, to 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 move a little bit, or or some little effect. It's, it's almost like what we're what they're trying to do is say, okay, we know that ninety nine point nine nine percent of the stuff that's going on here that that's measurable is the machine. But I want to show that there's a little ghost in the machine as well, and the ghost can can yeah. do something. It's a wimpy yeah. ghost, but it can do stuff. I'm not saying everybody's okay. like that, but but it seems to be many of the theories are of that type. So there is a machine, but there's not just the machine. There's this wimpy little ghost. Right, and, right. Okay. And, and and now I'm remembering where I was going. It's that okay. there seems to be this underlying desire to prove that your consciousness is also affecting right. physical quote unquote reality, which which they would say is, you know, real as a dualist. There's like some kind of dualism between, you know, there's mind and then there's physical or there or whatever binary concepts. And one can influence the other albeit very infinitesimally, as you point out, according to these experiments. And right. yeah, so please continue. And also, I would love to hear your notion of how, I guess in your mind, there is no two forces. The, the one force is what you would call consciousness, right? And then everything else is kind of cascading from whatever that is through different processes like, you know, this amplitohedron that is assigning values and um and and whatnot to to right. basic bits of what we would call matter R right so so in some sense yeah what i'm saying is is far more radical than many of my psi friends are, are. so right they're, they're saying there is this random number generator it's a it's a physical system it's a physical device but your consciousness can affect a little bit of its behavior probabilistically and 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 i'm saying um you're not being bold enough. <laughs> the random number generator is entirely a product of your consciousness. It doesn't exist unless you perceive it. So don't worry about the, the, the bits, the little bits that you might be able to influence, the entire thing. So, so you're, you're not thinking big enough. Think space, time, and objects themselves are entirely psi products. So there's no machine. We're not trying to get a little ghost in the machine. We're tr we're showing that the whole machine is an illusion. The ghost is the whole story, and that's mm -hmm. that's uh, that. I think that's a, a much happier outcome that the psi community would like better than what they're doing. I, I think that once you let go of the machine and try to get a little wimpy ghost in the machine and realize, no, no, we want a theory in which the ghost is the whole thing and the machine is an illusion. Mm -hmm. That's so now you're now you're I think. So I, I've outdone outside the side people right now. This is even yeah. a deeper notion of psi than than perhaps they were they were bargaining for. You, you go in if you go in with both feet and just let go of space time. But that's what our best theories are telling us to do. As I mentioned, quantum field theory, gravity, and evolution of a natural selection. So let's go big on psi, and that's what I'm really trying to do with this theory of conscious agents. Is, is saying it, it, it's um, it's it's conscious consciousness all the way down it's, it's conscious imperialism yeah. right this thing is the whole story at mm -hmm. least in, in this by the way i have no theory of everything any as well right uh, my scientific theory of everything is just the next baby step but in this baby step consciousness is the fundamental assumption yeah. that i'm making conscious experiences and we show that the machine is just a, a little a virtual reality one of the virtual realities that consciousness can, re can create, one of countless, space-time is one of countless VRs. Not, not the big one, it's not the most important one, there's nothing special about it. It's one of 
countless different VRs that 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 evolution uh, that the evolution of consciousness is, is exploring. Mm-hmm. And so, in that sense, this is everybody, everything that the psi community would want, and much, much more. It, the ghost has turned into, you know, the, the, the mighty, the mighty one that's creating the whole thing. And so. That, that's a completely different direction. And so that's what I'm hoping to do here. <laughs> okay. So so one of the things that I am very ambivalent on that has become like a total new age meme at this point is the idea of consciousness affecting quote unquote reality or what, what I guess in your theory would be the icons of quote unquote reality that somehow my mind can in some sort of pro-noic psychic event you know collapse possibilities in my favor you know so like i can i guess what would popularly be called manifesting and as i said i'm very ambivalent on this because i think it gets used in 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 very uh gross low-hanging fruit kind of fantasy scenarios a lot of the time that rub me the wrong way but on the other hand, I've experienced undeniable synchronicities that like made the hairs on the back of my neck stand up and just enough strange things mm. to not be able to dismiss the notion that my consciousness is somehow interacting with reality. Um, and then, of course, people are going to g- give them an inch and they'll take a mile on that on that kind of idea. But but what is how do you think about that? And where, where do you land, if anywhere, on that scenario? Well, I, I think that the possibility that there could be synchronicities and that somehow the quality of your consciousness, the whether it's a negative or positive kind of mood that you're in and so forth, or open versus closed-minded, could, could, could affect things. But so, so I'm, I'm, I'm completely open to it, to, to that possibility. On the other hand, I have never seen a theory of it. Right. So again, I'm, I'm a scientist. Um, there's nothing on the table until you have a theory on the table. Of course, ideas are great and we should debate them and so forth. But you're not even playing the game of science yet. Right. So so this is this is not even it's not even on the playing field. Mm-hmm. What we need is a precise theory. And, and, you know, again, I'm playing with my my colleagues on this theory of conscious agents. That theory um, should be able to tell us at some point when once we can get space time emerging from it, whether you know, and how conscious agents which are not inside space time could affect the the detailed structure of you know, you know the physical laws even inside that particular VR. So how how does how could conscious agents affect that? So so ultimately we we want a theory that's mathematically precise and. We're a long way from that. So, so, so my attitude about about this is is, is as follows. I, I think that we should, of course, before we have a theory, try to gather as much evidence as we can about this. Are there synchronicities? Can we can we in a hard nosed fashion document them in a way that that's really credible and and, and replicable? Or can we replicate things? Is there some experiment that we can replicate over and over again that shows some kinds of synchronicities? If not, why not? Right. And and if yeah. so, do it and get get the data. So we even without a theory, we should do that. But then, the hard work is give me a theory that explains precisely the synchronicities you think you found, and could be falsified by patterns in the synchronicities that you don't predict. Until then. We should be very, very modest about our claims, right? We even about the data that we claim. We should say <clears throat> we should be very modest and say these are the experiments that we've done so far, or these are these the accounts that we've you know the incidents that we've count, come up with. Incidents are not data. Incidents are, I think, should be taken seriously. We should look at them, but but we can't build a scientific theory out of them. They're not scientific data in that sense. So we have to be very, very modest, not jump beyond our theory, our theory that we don't have at this point and not claim to know. So in other words, my attitude is we should be very humble about this. Look for the data. Absolutely. Try to document it 
don't claim to know how this thing works until you have a mathematical theory. I mean, there's just, yeah. there's no reason to claim it. Um, and then start looking for a mathematically precise theory outside of space time based on consciousness that can predict these synchronicities. Um, so, so, so yes. So I'm saying in, in some sense, I'll put it this way. We need to be more serious about this than we're being right. Don't just talk about it. And let's, you, you like synchronicities, build a theory. Let's get serious about this. Build a mathematical theory that explains why we should have these synchronicities and what patterns we should have. So I'm saying, let's do more, not less than what we're doing. We need to do more. Uh, and I'll just give a, a, a quick analogy about how science works on this. In 1905, Einstein wrote down his special theory of relativity. Mm -hmm. It's a mathematically precise theory. It's, it's a beautiful theory. And it made clean predictions. When, when Einstein, in 1922, he won the Nobel Prize. It was not for his theory of special relativity or general relativity. And the Nobel Prize Committee was very, very clear about that. Mm -hmm. They didn't think that his theory of, of relativity was right. So, so th think about this. You're Einstein. Your theory is mathematically precise. It has made several brilliant predictions and yet the scientists are still like this yeah uh, that's what you have to expect from science and that is correct it yeah. is correct for science to be that way we really have to put our theories through the gauntlet before we let them be come onto the stage and say okay this is our new framework in which we're working on so so for people in the side community we have to take this far more seriously and, and understand that there, there's no chance to be taken seriously ourselves until there's a mathematical theory. And then even if we're Einstein and we have all the data to, to 20 years later, uh, the best scientists in the world may still not believe your theory. Uh, and, and that's good. That, that puts the bar really high and it says we really have to do our work and show this stuff. So, so I'm, I'm not discouraging this high work. I'm saying let's up our game. Mm -hmm. We need to up yeah. our game. But but there there is the funny thing that happens though when the old um, vanguard tip of the spear revolutionary idea becomes the institutionalized idea, right. which is the case with relativity, right? right? Now, like they're they're fighting tooth and nail for my non expert POV to to prove that it's true, and and they hold up recent discoveries right. as as further proof that it is true. Like you know the all the stuff with um gravity waves, for example, like many people use that as an example to prove like, look, uh, uh, Einstein theorized that there were gravitational waves and look, we found them and it fits into his theory of relativity. But in, in your mind and in the mind of many other physicists, that is not the case. So th I think that's why it's so difficult as a lay person that if you're looking at this with interest, how do you know who to trust? Because you have all of these smart, capable people thinking they've got the thing. Like you've got the string theorists right. thinking they have the thing, the relativist, relativ relativityists thinking they have it, the quantum physicists thinking they have it. So at, at what point did you break away from all that and think like, no, 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 this is, none of this is it. And, and I don't think not only is none of this it, I don't think whatever it is exists yet to a point where I've got to come up with something better. I've got to come up with something that not only accounts for these gaps, but takes consciousness seriously, because after all, you're a cognitive scientist, you're not a physicist. But yeah, at, at what point, you know, did you feel like, I understand this well enough to know that this is not it. Um, and and if, if anybody out there is like, uh, you know, vary into any of those paths I, I just mentioned, you know, string theory, quantum physics, relativity, what would you say to them to, that would convince them to like, look beyond that and understand that that can't possibly be the explanation for how reality exists as it is? Well, it's good to look historically for, for just a moment. So uh, for a long time, Newton and yeah. his theories were, were spectacularly successful. 
And you know, in the 1890s, many physicists thought that it was over. I mean, physics was done and, and you know, Newton had, had scored big. And there were a couple of things. There was Michelson-Morley experiments and black body radiation that were a little bit problematic or, or big problematic for Newton, but, but they figured that that would get cleaned up. And, you know, with, with Einstein and then the quantum theory, uh, you know, we, we got relativity and quantum theory and then quantum field theory. And, and that transcended Newton. Now, that doesn't mean that Newton is worthless. Newton is, we, we still use Newton to, you know, program rockets to go to the planets and so forth. It works very, very well. So, so Newton is brilliant. It's still a wonderful tool. But if you're looking to understand reality fundamentally, no one would ever go. The very concepts of space and time and Newton are the wrong concepts of space and time. We, mm-hmm. we, we know that. You, you have... Now, the same thing is going to be true about gravity waves, for example, and, and quantum field theory and, and Einstein's general theory of relativity. Within their, their framework, they're brilliant tools. And they will, even if we succeed in getting a theory of consciousness, where consciousness is fundamental, it, it, we will still use quantum field theory. We will still use Einstein's theory of gravity. They'll make fabulous predictions. And, and they'll be wonderful, wonderful tools. So it's not, it's not that they're wrong. It's that, it, like, Newton's not wrong. It's just that his framework goes so far, and then it reaches its own limits. Mm-hmm. And Gödel tells us, you, no matter what system you have, you will reach your limits. So Hoffman's system of conscious agents is going to run into the same problem. We're, we're going to find that my theory of conscious agents, whoa, Okay, here's as far as it goes. So we're going to have to take the next step, and this will. This is what I mean by the job security. So, so it's I am absolutely not putting down any of the more brilliant theories that have come before. They're all stepping stones, and what's brilliant about these stepping stones and what makes science so powerful is that our good theories tell us precisely where they stop. Hmm. So, for example. We know that space-time stops at 10 to the minus 33 centimeters. It doesn't even make sense beyond that. Okay? So it tells... Now, it doesn't tell you what's next, but it's a wonderful antidote to dogmatism. Mm -hmm. And that's one reason to do science in the realm of spirituality. Once you get scientific theories that tell you where they stop, it's hard to be an intelligent scientist and to be dogmatic because your own theory is looking you in the face and saying it, you know, in the case of space time, at 10 to the minus 33 centimeters, uh, your concepts don't even make sense. They have no operational definition anymore. So you better be looking for something beyond. Uh, and so, so it's in that sense that you can see my attitude. It, it's, it's actually an, a very inclusive attitude. I love Newton. I love quantum field theory. I love you know, Einstein's gravity. These are all wonderful steps. And in their domain, they're brilliant and right in their domain, but they're, they, they themselves tell us that there's a deeper theory. And so as scientists, it's our, our pleasure and our responsibility to jump into the dark beyond space-time and into the dark beyond whatever our current state-of-the-art theory is, to jump into the dark beyond that theory, come up with new, deeper assumptions that can explain everything, right? We have to, well, my theory of conscious agents better explain everything that we can get from quantum field theory, gravity, and everything from Newton. If, if we can't do that, um, then the deeper theory is wrong, right? So these old theories, Newton and Einstein and quantum, these are acid tests hmm. for any deeper theory of consciousness. They're really hard-won insights, and we have to preserve those insights or, or understand precisely how we have to transcend those insights where the theories themselves are telling us, this is the place you need to transcend me at 10 to the minus 33 centimeters. That's one place that, that you've got to go deeper. Yeah, so it's, it's, you can yeah. see that nothing's wasted. The physicalist work where space-time is fundamental has been incredibly useful. We've understood our headset backwards and forwards. We've understood the VR, and now it's time to take the first step outside of that VR. Yeah, it's like a contextual re-understanding. It, right. It's not that these things are incorrect. It's that the context that you're explaining them within, you haven't gotten yet. And then That's there's right. going to be another one that you haven't gotten yet and another one that you haven't gotten yet. 
and that is such a deep 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 mind fuck that you can't you right, just right. can't like because you don't know what you don't know so you have to trojan horse your understanding with something you can wrap your mind around and then eventually you get a very foggy picture of what's hiding inside the belly of the trojan horse right and right. and and then and then again you have to do the same exercise probably ad infinitum and you just are only probably ever going to be scratching the surface as long as you're existing in a human meat suit and right. Right. you know and this I, gives I, a different yeah go yeah, ahead this yeah. gives a different uh, take on the sci thing as well so every time you might say look so you're saying that you know there's this endless progression of theories and then you know, every theory will always be just the next step. Why bother? And it's just like, okay, you know, gee, you know, but here's, there's two reasons to, to bother. One is of course, just you're learning more, you're exploring, you're learning more and it's just, it's rewarding in its own sake. But the second thing is, is this, every time we make a new theoretical step, new technologies evolve. Yes. And if you, if you told someone in 1800 that, um, Michael and Don, separated by hundreds of miles, uh, and, and no no cables between them of any kind, can talk and see each other, um, and have a conversation. They would go. That is as much sigh as I could have ever imagined. That's yeah, that's that's right. be, that that's 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 ghostly kind of weird kind of stuff. Well, that's just technology that came out of our deeper theory. So, if consciousness is fundamental. Our theories of that outside of space time will give us new technologies, brand new technologies. For for example, I mean, of course, I don't know what the technologies will be, but but just for an example of what they might be. Right now, most of the galaxies that we see, we could never go to. There's all this real estate out there waving at us, and it's completely inaccessible if we go through space time because the galaxies are receding to us from us faster than the speed of light. So. So we can't get to them, but that's if we are taking space time as fundamental and, and we don't know anything beyond space time. But what if we have a theory beyond space time and we can now learn to play with space time as a data structure, then I might be able to go to Proxima Centauri, not through space time, but, but just completely outside space time, not even wormhole, something that transcends even the notion of a wormhole, just go outside of it. And that would, to our current way of thinking, be far more psi than, than moving ma- random number generators. Just like, so, so in other words, when you take the point of view that consciousness is fundamental, the kind of psi technology that you're going to get is not moving random number generators. It's, it's, it's like taking you to yeah. Proxima Centauri without going through space-time. So it's a far deeper thing that we should be going after in terms of this, uh, the psi community. Right. So, and, and that's every time we make a new step in our scientific theories, um, we get two rewards at least deeper understanding, even though we're just scratching the surface, and new technologies that transform our life and give us, but in some sense right now, if consciousness is fundamental, what we're learning right now is that you and I are talking is that somehow consciousness is so interesting and so powerful that Mike and Don, Michael and Don, hundreds of miles apart, can instantaneously communicate with each other and share ideas without touching each other. We've never even shaken hands. And we can do that. 200 years ago, that would have been inconceivable. No, nothing that in the psych community would have been anywhere near that grandiose. No claims would be that grand. Here's a grandiose claim. I, with my side, will be able to talk with a guy named Michael hundreds of miles away from me without ever being anywhere near the guy. And we'll have a conversation. Grandiose. Here we're doing it. And so this is quote unquote psi, but it comes from a deeper theory. So a deeper theory, this mathematical precise. So this mm-hmm. will happen repeatedly that every time we make a new deeper theory, new technologies will come out and we'll explore in some sense, the yeah. deeper yeah. abilities of consciousness, the deeper possibilities of consciousness and every step will be stunning. And there's and, countless steps. Yeah. And, and to me, the implications of what you're saying are so almost I don't know if you're going to agree with me on this but to me it turns the scientific method and mathematics into almost like a wand because if if you weave together 
adept enough spell using these tools, it's like you're literally cornering reality into certain behaviors that you've logically proven should be the case or something. It's like you can almost turn it inside out from discovery to creation in a strange way. Because if you're using consciousness, which is the fundamental aspect of reality, who's to say you're not creating as much as you are discovering? You know, it's it's almost like if you if you apply enough just sacrifice, like turmoil, blood, sweat, and tears, it's it's like you pr- you're producing something almost that that yields rewards rather than like uh, exploring in the forest or something like that and finding a treasure. Like, do, do you ever think of it that way, or or is that totally just me being a being overly wooey? Well, no, I think that's a really important issue. Um, the question that you could put in this area is, look, if you say consciousness is fundamental, what is it doing and why? Hmm. Right? That, that's, that's a theory has to explain. You know, okay, you're a scientist. You say consciousness is fundamental and it's doing something. Okay, well, what is it doing and why is it doing it? And in, right now, I don't have an answer, right? It's It's... But I have, there's one idea and I've only, by the way, I've only run across one idea that that's deep enough to, to at least be on the table. I'm not saying it's right, but it's on the table. And that's the girdle's incompleteness theorem. And, and one way to think about that is that it's, girdle is telling us that there's no end to the exploration of mathematical structure. And if consciousness is all there is, then mathematical structure can only be about consciousness. And so what Gödel's theorem is then telling us is that there's no end to the exploration of mathematical structure. Mathematical structure is only about consciousness. That means there's no end for the self-exploration of consciousness for of itself. And so that would be a deep enough principle for me for, to say, well, okay, that's that's pretty deep. So consciousness is is exploring, and, and the reason it's still exploring is because in principle, there's no end to it. So that's why it's still exploring. <laughs> uh, and, and, and that's why we find that science can never have a theory of everything because it, it, it's, the exploration is endless. And, and this is all in principle. So, so I think that that's one, one way to think about, about the whole thing. And, and it takes you very, very deep because it, it, it really does force you to confront that that question about what is consciousness doing and and why and and, and if you don't like the girdles incompleteness theorem uh, idea then then what is another idea i mean and i'm all i'm i would love to have 10 ideas on the table to to mm-hmm. to, to think about um i think that i think too to an extent wouldn't like the hegelian dialectic be a similar concept because it's you know yeah. Any time that you have the the collision of two ideas or or data sets or whatever it is, you're going to get this epiphenomenal thing of a new thing, right? You're going to have some outgrowth that comes from the interaction of those two things that wasn't there before, or you at least didn't conceive of. And now you also have to factor in for this third thing. And the third thing then collides with other concepts. And it's the, again, it's this infinite process of interconnecting with new and old ideas that recontextualizes everything. That's, that's a very important point, Michael. And, and it does have an analog in the mathematical model of consciousness that my hmm. colleagues and I are working on. It's we, so our theory of consciousness is built on the structure we call a conscious agent. Yes. Okay. Now this agent has no self. Um, and it's, it's very, very simple mathematical structure. And if, if people want to see that there's a paper called objects of consciousness, if you just Google my name, Donald Hoffman and objects of consciousness, you can get the paper online for free. It's, it's, it's trivial to get it. So you can read the, the theory, but what, what we do is we have this definition of conscious agent. And then it turns out when you have two agents interacting, they satisfy the, the interacting pair satisfies the definition of being an agent. So they are also one agent. Mm, okay, I get it. Yeah. So, so there is this along the lines of what you're talking about, is like the Hegelian kind of thing, the dialectic. You have a dialectic of these, these two conscious agents, and 
the fusion of the two different agents creates a new agent. And then yeah. that agent interacting with other agents will create yet more agents. And it turns out since every pair of agents is an agent, there's also one agent. There is the one agent. So this oh, is a very interesting, interesting mathematical. I mean, again, I'm not saying my mathematical theory is, is right or even the final word by any means. But but what this current theory is is saying that any pair of agents that interact or or even just formally just that, that are there also form a new conscious agent. But if they interact, then there is this dialectic that you were talking about. And there is the, the, the one agent. But the one agent, see, in, in a lot of spiritual traditions, they might talk about the one. Yeah, yeah. But 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 we have analytic tools now because we can take in a scale free fashion, we can take the, the one agent and use the notion of a conscious agent to essentially break it down into all these dynamics of interacting conscious agents so we can explore the dialectic. Um, and and so, so it gives us these tools to really look inside the hood of how consciousness might, might be working. Um, but of course, it's just one peak out of an like, endless number of peaks that we're going to have to go after. Yeah, that's it's very thought-provoking to start recreating or rediscovering these what would be spiritual or esoteric frameworks for the structure of reality through modern means. And I mean, for me, that's a source of like huge wonder. And, you know, I, I hope it's not like a self-fulfilling prophecy to start, you know, seeing things like Indra's net of jewels or, uh, um, you know, like I, I remember the first time, and, and I don't know if this comes into play at all with these um, transcendent objects that are almost platonic solid, like that you were talking about before. But I remember the first time I saw that, that E8 crystal structure right. in, in um, theoretical physics, and it looked exactly like this um, drawing in an old Kabbalistic book. I think it's like the Sefer Yet Yeritza, I believe, mm -hmm. where it looks exactly like this big interconnected, uh, like, you know, one of the, I believe it's like one of the frameworks of God it looks like this big interconnected geometric structure that looks identical to the E8 crystal. And it's just like, I don't know what, if anything, this means, but I can't unsee it. And it has absolutely um, sparked deep curiosity in me where, where it's almost feels like a wink or something, but I, I don't know. I of course don't know what to make of it, but uh, it will well, never stop being interesting. I think that these are, all, these are all very interesting and suggestive things that I think that um, in the interaction between science and spirituality, scientists um, as a group, in, there are individual exceptions, of course, but science has been primarily a physicalist framework. Right. So, so spirituality is um, really not on the table too much in, in, in the science so far, right? It's with the study now of the neurobiological correlates and, and bases of consciousness, there's, there's attempts to start to use a physicalist framework to understand consciousness. And they're having trouble you know, for the reasons that we've talked about that you know, space time isn't fundamental, but spiritual traditions have had the idea of consciousness being fundamental for thousands of years. Right. And, and so I think that they have some brilliant insights because they're, they're a little head on the game. So they've had people thinking about this and, and meditating and practicing what the spiritual traditions have not had. And what the scientists have is this incredible tool of being precise and having your theory tell you itself its limits so the theory itself is so precise that it tells you where dogmatism has to stop. Mm -hmm. So, so the precision and the anti-dogmatism is the critical new piece of the puzzle that science can bring. So if we bring the insights from the spiritual traditions and the new technique of exploration that we get from science, I think that, that, we can make incredible progress. I, I think that we have to be open and flexible and be willing to have things that we absolutely knew were true turn out to be false. We all knew that the earth was the center of the universe. We all knew that the earth was flat. Yeah. We now all know that space and time are fundamental. Well, 
what we thought we knew is is deeply wrong. And so, but but so there will be aspects of this insights from spiritual traditions which will turn out to be real insights and real gems, and then there'll be nonsense. Yeah, and we'll find both, and it'll hurt for people who've been you know tied to the nonsense and, and believed it. it. It'll be it'll be difficult when we realize that that can't be, or it was a tiny aspect of a much deeper picture and it really was misleading or something like that. So, so that's what, so we have to, all of us approach this in the spirit of humility. <laughs> yeah. We, we want to be precise so we can figure out precisely where we're wrong. And also because being precise allows us to build technologies once we have a good theory and we should like our theories enough to pursue them and explore them but we should not be dogmatically attached to them. That's right. that. And so that's, so having that attitude, I think, so, so letting go of dogmatism is really hard for, for human personalities among scientists, as well as spiritual people. Right. Scientists are as dogmatic as anybody else on the planet. So it's not that scientists are not dogmatic. It's that the scientific social structure mm-hmm. that has been set up where a scientist has to put out a theory that's mathematically precise or, or you won't be listened to. And you have to put up precise experiments that can be replicated or you won't be listened to. But if, you're, if you put that stuff out there and you're listened to, then other scientists are going to try to show that you're wrong. Yeah. yeah. And, and so usually the scientist doesn't try to show why he or she is wrong. It's the, why they try to show why someone else's theory is yes, wrong. But sure. that's fine. So, so, so science is a social institution, even though you have a bunch of Scientists, many of whom may be dogmatic, some are, of course, probably um, not dogmatic, but but many are. Many we're just human beings. We're we're dogmatic, but as a social institution, we we have this fix for dogmatism that allows us. Dogmatism. What does it do? It's it it stops you from figuring out where you're wrong. You should want to figure out as quickly as you can where you're wrong, so that you can make the next step. If you just right. assert that I'm right and nothing can dissuade me, well, that's the good way to be stuck in a rut. So to have ourselves really being open, saying these are the best ideas that we have so far, but we, even from spiritual traditions, we know my concept isn't the thing. And maybe the concept that I thought was the best pointer to the thing turns out to be um, not as good as some other pointers that are going deeper. So you could think about science as giving us even better and better pointers and pointing out the limitations or the downright falsities of earlier pointers. So that's another way to think about this yeah, thing. And how oh, do yeah. we get the pointers to evolve? We don't, you know, it's, it's, it's not a point of honor or a point to be bragged about that I'm using the same pointers that they used 3000 years ago. I mean, <laughs> right. I, I would perhaps say that surely Consciousness can be moving along and getting deeper and deeper pointers. There's, we, we, we know that it's endless, that our conceptual systems um, can't ever penetrate to the core of consciousness. But, but that doesn't mean that there shouldn't be any progress in our pointers. Yeah. And so yeah, science and yeah. spirituality could make those pointers progress. You know what this is making me think of, Don, because I, I think in the more mythopoetic way where you tend to think in the more analytical way, is there's this amazing Joseph Campbell lecture where he's talking about um, the uh, the chakra system, and he gets to talking about the Ajna chakra, which is the third eye visionary chakra, where you you can actually have a direct experience of the transcendent, you know, unity beyond concept. And one of the symbols used to depict that is this like meditating figure holding the severed head of the creator. And he explains that in order to experience the thing, you have to kill the thing. Mm -hmm. You have to kill the concept of the thing because the concept is not it. That's a mask. That's merely a, a construct you've conveniently used to try to explain the thing. And you've always got to get to a point where you kill the construct, where you kill the concept if you want to understand right. more deeply. And it totally makes sense to me why these uh, sacred cows of science need to be sacrificed. Right. And I wonder, 
Is there something, maybe this is the final sacred cow or the final dogmatism that I don't know if even you can can uh, can sacrifice, is does science itself need to change to allow for some kind of subjective element? Because everything about the way that we experience consciousness right now is subjective. And I think that maybe Philip Goff brought up this similar idea uh, in our conversation is that there's always some subjective element to experience and to the scientific process. Mm -hmm. So is there a way to bring subjectivity or consciousness itself back into the equation? Or does yes. that somehow kill the scientific process? No, I, I, that's an excellent question. And I think a critical one. If consciousness is fundamental and any conceptual understanding of consciousness only scratches the surface. But we're not separate from consciousness. We are consciousness. You, you and I are conscious and, we, and we're part. So there's this, if it's really true that consciousness is fundamental and, and it's, according to Gödel, infinitely beyond any conceptual system. It's, there's this deep intelligence there's this unbounded intelligence that we are, that each scientist is. Each scientist is not separate from, but identical to this unbounded intelligence. So in addition to reading our papers and doing our equations and doing our experiments and going to conferences, why not spend time meditating and tapping into that infinite intelligence. And, and in many cases, I think the, the scientists who really make the most creative contributions are doing that, whether or not they know it, they go into silence. I think Einstein was explicit about this, right? He, mm -hmm, he, mm -hmm. he was explicit that it wasn't like just the equations. It was like, no, no, I was going in this deep conceptual space, even beyond okay. words. Is that like Gedanken or what, what word did he use? Something like... Well, thought the thought experiments. Yeah, these yeah. Gedanken experiments. Thought yeah, experiments. Yeah, Gedanken exactly experiment. right. yeah. But, but, but even something deeper than those thought experiments, it was it's clear that Einstein w w was going very, very deep with really these loose images and, and so forth, going very, very deep. And then he would pull it into a Gedanken experiment and then pull it down into mathematics. It would take a long time. So there were the, he was going into these depths. And I think many scientists do that, the ones that are creative. And if we train our scientists and say, look, you are not separate from this infinite intelligence. You are. Try it out. Spend time on a daily basis being silent, letting go of the conceptual system. You can li literally then go be that infinite intelligence and then come back with thimblefuls of, of insight from that, yeah. that endless mm -hmm. bound, bounty of, of intelligence and get the next step in our scientific theories. And, and maybe that's what consciousness is about. I mean, consciousness, you know, what is it up to and why? If it's about understanding itself, well, if you don't, if consciousness doesn't spend time with itself, how is it going to understand itself? So it's not just the experiments. It's not just the theory. It's really dipping back into the, the huge infinite well of intelligence to go back. And, and so maybe this is what, what consciousness is doing right now is, it's developed spirituality on one on one side. It's developed a scientific method. Never the twain shall meet, hardly at, at, until this point. But now we can bring the two together, and scientists can deep dip into the in, infinite intelligence, and then the spiritual people that have been dipping into the infinite intelligence can now have the tools to actually make sense of what they dipped in and brought back. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and so, so science and spirituality together is consciousness putting together the tools to really explore itself more, more deeply. So, yeah. So, so yeah. yes, that makes sense. It's like the intuitive and the analytical somehow harmonizing with one another, both yes. within the individual scientist and within the community at large. And I think that that makes so much sense and it fits into the framework of the uh, Hegelian dialectic too, right? Mm -hmm. The two binaries coming together to, to make the, the epiphenomenal new, thing to increase the the scope of understanding and imply the next step or imply the next question 
And I, yeah, I mean, there, there's something that really resonates about that to me. And also, you know, if you just like look back at ancient cultures and all of the incredible things that they were able to accomplish with like megalithic structures and their understanding of math and, and the night sky, you know, clearly they had math, clearly they had language, clearly they had logical systems, but clearly they also had contemplative spiritual practices that seem to be central to these insights. And I mean, you can see that now going, you know, talking to modern day people who think in a shamanistic animistic framework is like, they will tell you the plants told us this, the ancestors told us this to them. That is their framework of understanding. And it might sound outlandish from, from our angle, but then if you think about, well, how did they find this plant among hundreds of thousands of plants in the rainforest? How did they manage to uh, build structures so architecturally sound that they stand to this day in immovable majesty, you know, in the middle of the desert? Like clearly they were able to bring together vast sums of knowledge and apply them into the world. And I think that that maybe to me, Don, that's way sexier than some crazy ancient aliens or some crazy, you know, out there theory is that they were combining knowledge in this way. They were combining the the intuitive and the mythopoetic with the analytical in ways that we have yet been unable to for, for whatever reason, for our biases, for our dogmas, for our uh, predilections or whatever. And yeah, I mean, if we could somehow rediscover some of that contemplative kind of wisdom and combine it, uh, that just, that excites me beyond all measure, Don. It really does. Yeah, no, I think you're onto a, a very important point there. Um, there is a, a researcher named Monica Gagliano. She, she's active right now, a brilliant researcher who was influenced by some traditional cultures and their understanding of plants. Mm-hmm. And she, what she learned from them got her to start doing new experiments on plants. And she's shown that plants can do classical conditioning. So she found, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You, you familiar with that? Yes, I am. Yeah, yeah. Right. So, so she is explicit in, in there's a movie called Aware that I highly recommend about consciousness. It's just called Aware. It came out just in the last couple of months. And she's interviewed in, in, in that. And, and Monica is very clear that, that she was influenced by these spiritual ideas from these, these cultures to do these experiments. And she found results where, where the plants can grow. They'll grow their roots toward a food source or water source. But what she found is if she had two different directions that they could grow their roots and she put a sound by the water source so that you, you're classically conditioned, the, wherever the sound is, there's the water source. The plant learns that. And when you take away the water source and just put a sound somewhere, the roots grow toward the sound. Mm-hmm. And, and, and most of my you know, biologists are like, they're stunned. They're, the plants can do cl- classical conditioning. So here's a case where, where science learned from the spiritual tr- traditions of course, now science is going to add its own new contribution as well. So you, you get this back and back and forth. I mean, if all of us are not separate from that one infinite intelligence consciousness, we all have access to it. And so even prior to science, people had access to this deep infinite intelligence because it's not separate from, from who you are. What they didn't have access to was figuring out what of their ideas are nonsense and what were the true insights that they got so that was the hard that's the hard part because if you look back in previous cultures there's brilliant insights as you pointed out and then we look and there's also nonsense and so the question was how do you how do you separate the wheat from the chaff how do you get the the, the good insights and and separate it out so that's where i think the two are going to be working really wonderful together science and spirit spirituality together yeah well put well put. So what's next, Don? What 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 is on the the tip of the spear for you? What ideas have you uh, salivating? What directions are you currently exploring in before we wrap this up? Well, as I mentioned, the um, the physicists have found these structures beyond space time that are stunning. I mean, they they give rise to space time. They predict the scattering 
events like at the Large Hadron Collider, they get the right probabilities, the right amplitudes. That, that is, is truly stunning. And But there are these static structures. There's no notion of uh, dynamics. And there's no notion of what it's about. It's just these structures work and they, they give rise to space time and it works. But, but, and, and, and I'm not complaining. I'm not, I'm not at, at all. I'm, I'm, I'm saying what they're doing is brilliant and it's brand new. It's only the last 15 years. So, I, you know, give them a break. They're, they're, there's a lot of work to be done. They've done a tremendous amount of work. But I'm looking myself. I'm, so I'm studying. There's a class that uh, Nima Arkani Hamed gave at Harvard. And he's gotten some papers and books, but the, the, the class at Harvard was a nice graduate class. There's 25 or 30 lectures that he gave where he basically takes you through and teaches you all, all these, the, all the structures. And so I've been studying that, I, you know, COVID took me out for a year. So I, yeah. I, that's, that, that's what I was doing when COVID took me out and I decided to take a year off. But uh, now that my health is, is starting to come back. Um, I'm salivating to get back in. I, I'm, I realized a year off, you know, I've learned, I've, I've lost a lot. So I've got to refresh myself on what I already knew and then move forward. But my, my goal is you know, as a scientist, even though you know that there's so many levels beyond, this is the level we're at right now. And this is the next baby step that we have to take, right? So the physicists have found these structures beyond space time. And this is all brand new work. So the obvious next baby step is to say, if I'm thinking that consciousness is fundamental, how does consciousness, a theory of consciousness, fit into yeah, and yeah. give rise to these deep structures that the physicists are finding so that we can now go from consciousness into space time? So for me, that, that seems like the obvious, an, an obvious, not, not the, but an obvious next step to take. And so that's, that's where I'm going. Now, I'm not a physicist, so, but I, I um, have physicists who are collaborators. And so, so we're working with them and they, they help tutor me where, where I'm um, ignorant, which is all over the place in physics, but you know, I get some tutoring and get some help and, and together with Chaitan Prakash and Chris Fields and, and others that I'm working with who actually know the physics um, or can learn it much more quickly than I can are, are working with me and, and we're working toward, toward that end. So, um, but ultimately, you I mean, I'm hoping to get other physicists who really know this stuff um, interested in the theory of conscious agents, uh, and once once that happens, then then I won't be able to keep up, um, and I won't be a, a rate limiting uh, intelligence on this. I'll have far more intelligent uh, physicists working on this stuff who can then start to move things forward, and I can just start to read their papers. So that's my goal. My my goal is to to get really brilliant physicists working on this theory of consciousness, so I can just uh, then try to catch up and read their papers if, if I'm smart enough to read them. <laughs> oh man, I can't even imagine, Don. I can't even imagine you not being able to to grok these ideas that that you were that you lit the the wick of. But I look forward to it. I mean, I man, I I'm so curious about these structures, these deep structures. Can, do these? Is there an appearance of these things that has been rendered? Is there, or is it just you can't conceive of it by looking at it? Like if, if people Google these things, will, will images come up? Yes. And in some simple cases, you can actually draw concrete pictures. If people are interested in this and they want, you want a very accessible article about this, there's a magazine called Quanta Magazine, Q-U-A-N-T-A mm -hmm. Magazine. And there's an article from, I think, 2013 in Quanta Magazine. Um, it's called a, a, a Jewel at the Heart of Physics. Oh, yeah, I think I've seen that. Yeah. And it, so it's a wonderful introduction. Um, it's now nine years old, but it's a wonderful introduction to the amplitudehedron and, and what it's about and these new structures. And then there is a, a more recent, in the last couple of years, there's an, uh, a Quanta Magazine article about Lauren Williams, uh, L-A-U-R-E-N Williams. She's a professor of mathematics at Harvard who, who has worked with Nima as well, Nima Arkani Hamed. And it, it, it gives in a way that people can understand an idea of the mathematics that is leading to these geometric structures. So, so she's an expert in something called the positive Grassmannian. Mm -hmm. And so there are pictures in this magazine of, of the positive Grassmannian in, in small cases. So you can actually see it and see what it's about. So if you go to Quantum Magazine, I, it's a great source for people who want to just get a little deeper insight into 
what's going on here. And they, they do a brilliant job when they have pictures. They actually have pictures of the geometric structures that are being um, plus intuitive explanations. So I would, I would highly recommend that magazine. Amazing. Amazing as always in general, Don. Thank you for taking me on the infinitely regressing wonder dip that you that you always are a fabulous pilot of. And is there anything that you want to point people toward? Obviously, you have your book, The Case Against Reality. Uh, you said you have mm -hmm. a talk coming up. Anything anything else specific? Uh, for people who are interested, I, I have a Twitter feed. So stuff that I'm doing, I put on the Twitter feed. So at Donald D. Hoffman, if they want to see my, my talks and um, see, see stuff. And there's a, a conference at Chapman University. Um, what, I forgot what it's called. I, that I'm giving a talk in just a couple of weeks. So people, I think that's going to be available online. So, I, so for those who might be interested, I'm going to, I'll, I'll put a link to in my Twitter feed to that, that conference where I'll be talking with um, some quantum theorists and uh, people who are um, my colleagues who are doing work in consciousness from a physicalist framework. So someone that does integrated information theory, a Larissa is going to be there. So, so it's going to be a, a nice, uh, interesting conference where consciousness researchers and quantum physicists um, come together and um, share ideas and try to understand that connection. Love it. Love it. And where is that? Where is that university physically? It's going to be at Chapman University in, in Orange County, California. Orange County. Oh, cool. Yeah. Cool. It, it, I got to make it to one of your events one of these days, Don. We got to have that that physical uh, local handshake one of these days. That, that would be that would be wonderful. Yeah. COVID will hopefully let up within yes. a year or two. <laughs> yes. Yes. All right, let's wrap it up, Don.